Hey everybody, two alpha gals here. I'm Debbie Nichols. And I'm Candace Mathis. And you're listening to In the Tall Grass, where we're sharing stories of reinvention, resilience, and rediscovering joy. Whether it's facing alpha gal syndrome or any other redefining chapter of life, we all have to learn how to navigate the journey through the tall grass. So here we go. Hey, everybody. So for this Tick Bite episode, Candace and I thought it was probably time to do a revisit now that we are five years down the road from our diagnosis. So we thought we would give you a glimpse into what our lives look like right now, um, a few years after the fact, because we realized that things are really different. And I think what drove that home for me was when Candace said earlier today, she Back back in the day when we were so sick, we thought things would never be the same, right? There was so much time where we thought things would never be the same. And the truth is, is that they're not the same. They're not the same at all. We don't eat the same foods. We don't behave the same way. We don't go to the same places. But the other side of that is that it's not that it's we're worse off, right? Things aren't the same, but in a lot of ways, we're better, so let's dive in and 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 chat about that. So looking back five years ago, Candace, back when we got our diagnosis, where was your head? Mm, my head was in a really dark place, I would say yeah. initially. I mean, I I remember just I was couch bound for so long, you know, probably six months, which is a long time, especially from someone that was really active to then not being active at all. Your independence is kind of stripped away from you. And I remember being so obsessed with reading journal articles, medical journal articles. And my husband would be like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm trying to figure this out. And, you know, it's, it's good to educate yourself, to feel like you're gaining knowledge But on the flip side, I think it was actually kind of preventing me from taking a step forward in a positive way, almost because I, it was keeping me kind of down, you know? And so that was probably my darkest point. And I just remember being told like, go for a walk, even if it's up and down your street, just start. And so I did. And it was hard. I was out of breath. My heart would race. You know, it was a very weird feeling for me. Um, But I did it. I committed to doing it. And I think I just kept doing something each day that was really challenging for me at the time. But then it kind of like compounded. And I think it's, I'm grateful that I took the step because had I not, I think I would have still been really sick in a way mentally. Yeah. I think something that helped us both during that really hard period. And and you jogged a memory when you were talking about that was that calendar that I had the, how to be a badass or you are a badass. That's what Uh it is. You are a badass by Jen Sincero. And I felt like every day was like a little high five from her (laughs) through that calendar. Like you can do this you can do hard things, right? Like if you're not doing stuff that scares the shit out of you, you know, right. (laughs) It's funny how I'll say little things like that, but it really turned out to be a big thing. Like little pieces of encouragement, little, little glimpses of hope that things were going to be possible had such a huge impact at that time. Yeah, Cause I, I remember those, that feeling, that initial feeling of relief when I got my diagnosis, right. I finally knew what it was that was making me feel so sick and I could change it. Right. Fine. I'll give up beef if I can, you know, start moving again without my joints hurting. But then I think that moment, my cruise story, which I won't rehash here because everybody probably knows it, but where I had my reaction on the cruise ship, there was this moment where I was thinking, okay, I guess I never travel again. I guess I'm never going to get to go. I'm just going to go home because home is our safe space, right? Like we get to, control it to some level, as long as you have supportive family. And, and so all I wanted to do was go home and not leave. And that's really no way to live your life. And so I think it's important to think about how you take that first baby step, that first step outside, that first walk, whatever it is, that's a tiny little step in the right direction to move you toward 
you know, where we are five years later, because we've come a really long way. Right. And I think it's important to share, you know, I know we don't talk about the really challenging season a lot or go into a ton of detail about that because we did choose to focus on the things that were going to bring us into a joyful space, but it took intention on our part to do that. And, you know, I know we're told a lot by people, especially, you know, we've been in the, in the new phase and that challenging time, it's, it's not escaped us at all, but we're not any stronger than any other person. You know, it's just, it's taken us the intentional steps to move us into the the place that we are now. So five years ago, if you would have told me I would have gone to New York city, I would have flown on an airplane. I would have driven by myself. I would have done X, Y, and Z tried new restaurants, albeit they're vegan. And you know, that is, that's kind of my balance. Like I am now plant-based, but I mitigate the risk a little bit there. Um, but I would have never, I would have never thought I would have been at this place that I'm at now. No, I, I would have never thought it for myself either. Okay. So I think you hit the nail on the head with something else you just said that really resonates with me. And that's being intentional about it because, you know, I, I tend to think scientifically sometimes, which tends to make me sometimes less reasonable (laughs) because I want to see things in black and white. And so when you start to talk about things like meditation and manifestation and being intentional about things, I used to tend to poo-poo those ideas right. <laughs> typically, but then I found that really harnessing some of those resources in order to be intentional had a huge impact on my day to day. You know, I use meditation apps, I use affirmations, I use all these things. I needed some training to be able to do that. Like I couldn't just settle in and be like, today I'm going to manifest good health, you know, For a while, I needed somebody to walk me through that. But now I feel like I can step into that space and be like, okay, so maybe today isn't my best day. I don't feel the best, but I'm going to manifest good feelings. I'm going to manifest hope because I know I'm going to get on the other side of this day. What do you use to be intentional? I mean, I think I definitely used a lot of the same tools that you did, be it prayer, be it meditation gratitude, affirmations. It it was kind of this all encompassing shift for me of, of utilizing all of the different modalities, if you will. I mean, Mm -hmm. I remember talking to myself in front of the mirror. I remember, Mm -hmm. you know, going through EMDR therapy, like discovering new coping strategies, you know, kind of was just this all in um, experience for me, but I was very committed to it. It was I knew that I had to do these things to get myself to the other side. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how long it was going to take. And, you know, I think it's important as with everything, it's practice, right? It it becomes a part of your routine, becomes a part of your habits. And I think it definitely helps kind of propel you out of the fear. You know, like we were talking about, I think before we started recording that, I don't know if we had not laid that groundwork prior to getting sick like this, if we would have been able to step into it the way that we have. Yeah. And I think that's important to mention because that's why we want to share this with everyone, right? Right. The impact that that groundwork does, whether or not you've done it prior to this or you're doing it now, or you're ready to step into that. I love that you mentioned gratitude too, because You had said that to somebody else recently about trying to embrace trying new things, right? And being thankful, actually sort of looking at your food and being thankful for the things it can do for you, for the things it can do for your health, for your body, for the nutrients you're going to get from it. I think that was another really important thing for me too, to be grateful for the things that I did still have, right? Like all of the vegetables that were just nourishing my body, all the, all the safe meats back when I was eating meat. And it's funny because I remember noticing when that had become a part of my life, when I had walked down to the barn and there was a snake in the barn. And for those of you that don't know, I am like scared to death of snakes. Like they just, I'm just, there's just something about them that it, it terrifies me from the inside out. And I saw a snake in the barn and all I could think was, 
thank you for being here. Thank you for being here to eat my mice, which are getting into my chicken food, which are, you know, a great reservoir for ticks. I know that you have a purpose here. And that's when I realized like, okay, this has become a part of my life now. And it has made me better right? in, in a way I didn't expect back when I had the diagnosis and, or when I first got the diagnosis and back when we were stepping into this space, I didn't realize how it was going to sort of impact my life on a broader level. Yeah. And that's beautiful. Cause I'd see a snake right now. and be like, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait till you have a rat infestation in your barn. Oh <laughs> yeah. Mm-mm. No, thank you. <laughs> no. So let's go back and revisit the, the idea of fear for a second, not fear of snakes. <laughs> like, though I could talk about that all day probably, but there are so many fears that we had five years ago. So many fears. There's so many fears to everything, right? Just yeah. living, living without Alpha-Gal syndrome there every day brings fear. But right. let's talk about some of these fears with Alpha-Gal and how they're not all gone, no. you know, but we've learned how to manage them. We've learned how to prioritize them. We've learned how to pick and choose which are worth riling up our emotions. How do you manage fear now? How do you, when there are, are so many ways to be exposed to alpha gal. How do you get a handle on that fear now? Oh, that's a really good question. I think I really look at things from a different perspective now because I'm not in that fight or flight mode constantly. And I think my body was in that state for so long for years. And once I got that calmed down, it allowed me to really make an assessment of risk. And honestly, I think, you know, as far as, as risk goes, most everyone with alpha gal probably thinks about what space they're stepping into, be it a restaurant, a family member's house, really everywhere we go outside of our safe space, which hopefully is our houses is a risk to some degree. But now that, you know, I, I keep thinking about, I just, my family and I just went to New York. So I'm, I'm going to reference that because that's the newest you know, most, most recent travel experience. And we sought out vegan or plant-based restaurants. So I knew fumes weren't going to be an issue. And then my risk assessment was very low. Like I only had to talk to them about carrageenan or agar because I'm reactive to that. So it made it easy to do that. And I don't know. Like, I think once you start to take the small steps and you have more positive experiences than negative. And yes, like I had to use my EpiPen a month ago, a month and a half ago, when I walked into a brewery that I've walked into a million times and they were cooking hamburgers that day and it got me, you know, but I think sometimes it's hard to really articulate. And I don't know if you've dealt with this, but it's hard to articulate kind of the acceptance that we have now and how the fear isn't driving the train anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah, no? I think you said that really well, right? Like the fear still exists. We're just not letting it control us. Yeah. And I think we mitigate it where we can, right? right. Like you said, you choose if you're going to eat out, you choose to eat oftentimes at a vegan restaurant because that's really going to limit the amount of fumes you're exposed to. It's going to minimize a lot of the things you're exposed right. to, right? There's not going to be cross-contamination in the same way that there would be in a place that's cooking with mammal. Right. Um, so you mitigate it. The fear is still there, but you mitigate it and then you don't let it control you. Right. And I think a really good way to keep it from controlling you is to just kn know that you have control by being prepared. Right. And so I think we, we talk about this in probably every episode, how important it is to be prepared for a reaction when it happens, not if, because right. Even you and I, who I feel like are some of the most qualified alpha gals in the in the world, yeah. we still do have reactions. Both of us recently have had bad reactions. And so I think just knowing that what you're going to do should a reaction take place helps sort of keep a handle on the fear that you've already mitigated. And so it does make it easier to step out and try new things, right. not in like a risky way even though everything, I feel like everything new is involves some level of risk. Right. You just have to prioritize. Mm, that's not a word. 
You just have to prioritize so that you know the level of risk you're exposing yourself to and what you're going to do yeah. should it go wrong. Right. Well, and to me, it's scare. It's scarier at this point in my life to think about letting the fear control me and forego experiences than trying. Yeah. I think it's the same for me too. And I think that it's so funny. Gosh, I'm really evaluating my whole life right now. <laughs> thinking like gratitude has really become huge because for the longest time I was scared to go out where I would be exposed to dicks, but it mattered to me more to be outside, which is where I've always loved to be, you yeah. know, from as far back as I can remember outside is the place I want to be. And so I walk the dog. We, we have a couple acres here that are wooded and I walk the dog two or three times a day through those woods and he's got on his insect shield gear and his, yeah. his flea and tick treatment. And I wear all my insect shield gear and take all the steps I can to mitigate tick exposure. But I walk through those woods and I think here I am doing the thing. Here I am doing the thing that makes me happy. I'm so grateful that I'm here. I didn't think I would be, but I'm able to do it. I know I'm going to check for ticks when I get back, but I should have been doing that all along anyway. Right. So I think, I think I'm with you. I think that it's more important to me that I figure out how to manage the risk that's there than to avoid it altogether because yeah. that's not the life I want to live. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, well said. I think this... Hopefully this will bring some encouragement to everyone listening, you know, take note of your little wins, take note of those wins every day of if it's, Hey, it's eight o'clock and I'm able to take a shower at eight o'clock in the morning instead of at three o'clock in the afternoon. That was something I am always aware of when I can get ready really quickly in the morning. Now I couldn't do that before, you know? Mm -hmm. So if it's walking your dog in the woods, if it's gardening, you know, whatever it is that you can find that little spark of gratitude, start there. Yeah, I like that. That's a great baby step. We have to take those baby steps. And oftentimes that's the only way we can get moving is that first little baby step. And even though it might feel small, it's the next one might be bigger. And then yeah. before you know it, you're hiking through the woods with your dog yeah. or eating out at a restaurant in New York City. Right. I think- yeah. We don't always know the outcome, right? We don't always know how things are going to turn out. We don't always know. And I, I think alpha gal adds an extra stressor to that. And that with the delayed reaction, even if we think we might've yeah. been exposed, we don't always know for hours, Yeah. but I think it's worth saying that you and I, we're not ready to, to settle or not doing because we don't know. No. Not today, C Tan. Not today, C Tan. Yeah, I think that's a really long way to have come in five years. Cause sometimes, like when we're reacting, it feels like feels like we haven't come that far. Okay. Except that we have. Except that we have. Okay. So you said something about small wins. Yeah, those small wins are so important. And you know, we'll hear people say oftentimes you're so strong for making it through this. But the fact is, is that if you're listening to this podcast now and you have alpha gal syndrome, it means you're doing something about it, which means that you're strong too. We're not any stronger than the next person. We're just trying to listen and collect information and absorb it and learn from it and do better. I brought up a quote recently uh, in a conversation we were having. And it was a Booker T. Washington quote that I think I probably read back in like high school when I was going through some stuff. I think my older sister actually sent it to me. And it's, he said that success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life, but by the obstacles which he has overcome. And so spend some time thinking about where you were, where you are now, and where you're going to go and how strong those obstacles that you are about to overcome make you. Yes. We'd love to hear about your wins. So feel free to reach out to us. Let us know. Yes. So that is a fantastic quote. I think everyone can really reflect on. And like Debbie said, we would love to hear your small wins. Tag us on social media, email us, let us know. Maybe we can start like a whole hashtag small wins thing. Yeah. Whatever it's called. <laughs> <laughs> Words. Tick brain. Like <laughs> 
A G S wins. No, that implies no. A G S does not win. win. <laughs> <laughs> Suck it, A G S. <laughs> we rise. Boom. Boom. All right. Until next time, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on In the Tall Grass. Visit us at twoalphagals.com. That's T-W-O alphagals.com. Or you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Two Alpha Gals. If you enjoyed listening, please leave a review and help us grow this community. We're all faced with obstacles on our journey, whether it be food allergies or tick-borne diseases. You might outgrow the reactions, but you won't outgrow the person you become. Ticks suck, but life doesn't have to.